Dark powers come in many forms. Most are based first and primarily on lies. Brethren, we are no longer trapped by dark powers. It's not just an idea, it's reality. God does not want replicas. He wants varieties. The church today. The whole world has the idea that everything is in their hands, right? Worldwide peace just needs a proper ruling authority. That's all. This is why the League of Nations was created after World War I. The League of Nations collapsed. Now we have the UN. It's not working either. So the nations continue to make plans for peace. Yet the way of peace, they do not know. That means there will be another try at it. It's going to come. But the Church of God has been given real hope. Real, not man-made hope. The Father has called the brethren privately, one at a time. And they have responded beginning on that day of Pentecost. It was written about in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Thanks to God and his written word, the church has begun to see through the fog of worldly lies. So let's ask about our roots. Where are our roots? <clears throat> we are all established as members of one body, one body, the body of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 2 verses says, Therefore, if you have been raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. So the direction is not to have our roots in the earth and the things that are going on in the earth. Organizations, no, politicians, governments, it's not happening, it's not working. This is our state of relationship with God. Raised together we are with Christ. It says that. We just read that. We are raised together with Christ. It's not just an idea. It's reality. When we pray, do we have in our mind when we pray, Father sitting in heaven, on his throne, and sitting next to him, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. That's what's happening. Having this mental image really helps with distractions. Have our prayers become routine, rehearsed? What if we realize they are listening to every word? They love to hear us tell them everything. They love it. Tell them our joys, 
There are thanksgivings, the praise. They want to hear what is troubling us. Do we need to be at ease? What do you need? Is there some conflict that needs resolution? Are you concerned about someone? Have you told God about everything? There's plenty of time. And after you have asked, can you let it be in his hands? Because he heard. We have been raised together with Christ, right? And this comes with an attached benefit. Brethren, we are no longer trapped by dark powers. It is true that the adversary can influence us, can trouble us, either directly by the power he has over our thoughts, or through others. Maybe a man or a woman, maybe a ruling authority will try to trip us up. Satan has powerful influence over people and rulers. As in the past centuries, it's true also today. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. This is just astounding statements that Paul makes. It's true. As far as God is concerned, we can come before him. And we do. Dark powers come in many forms. Most are based first and primarily on lies. Satan's way is lying. First thing he thinks of. This verse we just read means we have support to resist the evil power. When we come to face to face with that spirit which tempts us to sin, we can restrain ourselves. We have support. We are delivered from it if we apply our own determination to resist sin. The Holy Spirit will help us. In our prayers, we asked for that kind of help, right? Still, we are all different in many ways. We have widely varying experiences, different weaknesses, different strengths. Yes, we're all a part of the body of Christ, but we're all different. We have learned from the world many things. All that learning began from our birth. <laughs> Just think of what we learn in the first few months of life. We didn't need language. We only needed that built-in crying voice in the crib. We didn't have to travel or anything. We just cried. We cried hungry. And someone came and talked to us. And then they fed us. The same person kept coming all the time. It turned out to be mom. Mom was always there, but sometimes she took too long to arrive. So we learned to scream. It's a new technique developed on our own. It did work. Worked quickly. Learning new methods of complaining got you other things you wanted. Did you want the toy that you threw over the edge? You want it back? Holler about it. And this is 
when youngins start to show personalities. Built-in personalities. We're born with them. Parents see it right away. You had one kid. Now this new kid's different. From a mellow to demanding, sensitive to curious, these basic traits are part of us from the beginning. At some point, parental authority suddenly appears. Here's where parental personality, parental personality, begins to influence the child. It's a deep topic of childhood experiences that contribute to what we become in life. So everyone is different. God does not want replicas. He wants varieties. And he doesn't micromanage. He lets things happen and deals with it later because it develops our different personalities. Then there's bodily growth. Now, I want to talk about our growth in the body. It's the spiritual body I'm talking about. We did die in that water. We did start to think about the godly ways after baptism. We had a new life that people couldn't see. We did have a new life. But it wasn't obvious right away. Still, we found we were still fleshly, carnal, still prone to the old habits and inappropriate behaviors. We sometimes need to become very hateful of some parts of ourselves. We're just so frustrated. And we have to drown those things Again, Paul gave the Colossians a short list of things to drown again in the baptism waters, you know, in your mind. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire and covetousness, and he calls all those things idolatry. Thinking of them. Ahead of God's way. It's idolatry. Just as we have, each one of us, strengths, baggage, God has brought us individually into the church anyway. Why? To build us up. No one of us understands our ultimate, ultimate, functional place as part of the body of Christ. You know, there's a resurrection coming. How do we fit in after that? We don't know. We have to accept that. We are just dealing with our own life right now. Somehow, God will see to it that we are ready for our change. So, troubles will come. They will come. We have many troubles, many setbacks. Will we be discouraged? Will we get mad? <laughs> Who will we blame this time? Will we walk away fed up? Or will we keep trying, enduring, overcoming? It's a choice. Many have walked away. To our eyes, it seems they have walked away. Sure, some were really not of us. That's true. They were the tares. But we don't know who were the tares. Which ones? Or will we keep trying? Will they keep trying? We are not their judge. We just saw them walk away. Yet, have those who no longer fellowship with brethren 
forgotten everything? You have to ask. They were here for years, listening to scriptures read to them. Some of the absent ones may be learning big lessons by their present state in life. Maybe God has not given up on them. Probably not. At all. We should not make assignments as to their place before God. It's just wrong to do that. And we ourselves might stagger in our overcoming. Who knows? Who will rescue us? God will. There's another list of things to put off. You know, the way, the way it says put these things off in Colossians. It's um, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. That's in chapter 3, verse 8. So there's those lists of things you can always go over and check yourself up. When we reflect back to our calling and baptism, wasn't it a great excitement as if beginning an adventure? So much to learn, so much to understand. When we are troubled, it is useful to remember the, faith, the faithful of the Old Testament. Abel was murdered. Yes, Abel was murdered by his own jealous brother. He's listed in Hebrews 11 as a faithful man. He was murdered. Yet, when we turn away from God due to the influence of the big three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, those things which we all memorize, that's 1 John 2, 16. That's what happens. That's what gets us, because we're still flesh. We still are under the influence of Satan. Satan is on the loose. But Paul goes on to encouragement, giving the positives. The to-do list, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. That's in verse 12. Let's do that. I know it's a list, it's just a list, but we can take each item one at a time, analyze ourselves, not the other guy, ourselves, write down our shortcomings, work on it, give it time. It takes time. Look how much time God gives us. Yes, we are all different, and that is what God wants. He has called all of us different folks. You see, we're all different. He's called us anyway. All the different materials are needed to build a house, for example. And this example is given in the Ephesians chapter 2. It says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Household of God. I love that phrase. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we're starting to talk about construction work. That was Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. God brings us together, many people from all the nations. For what? For what? It goes on in verse 21. In whom? So Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
in whom you also are being built together for what? For a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So all these different materials are needed to build a structure. And that's why we're all different. It's just common sense. The temple of God gives us the picture of what God wants. The temple of God. I recommend reading about the dedication of the temple in King Solomon's time. It's an astounding read. It's a tremendous display of God's approval at that time and place. Second Chronicles chapter 6 and 7. You should read it when you get home. God intends to live among the household of God. The saints, brethren, are being prepared to be a holy dwelling place in which God joins us. We are in the process of being assembled into that holy temple. When you read that in, in Solomon's temple, about that Solomon's temple, it's a stamp of approval that God gave to creating a dwelling place and worship place for God. Yes, it was a physical temple, but it's a, an approval that God, you have to read it. He approved of it. Now, those people were sinners, but they were joyful in creating that temple and dedicating it that day. It's tremendous, tremendous. Satan has the power to entice us, to lead us into trouble. Satan, though, is a tool utilized by God to develop a life experience that hardens us to the horrors of sin's consequences. Look at the, the world today, all the wars. The book of Job teaches us that God will utilize Satan to do harm to us for the sake of godly discipline. You know what happened to Job? God used Satan. He will be removed, Satan will be, from the spiritual environment at exactly the right time when he is no longer useful. Satan is not all-powerful. God is. Satan will be removed by God at the appropriate time. We're looking forward to that because it tells us of the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth. For now, that satanic spirit prowls around. Just as in the Garden of Eden, Satan may offer a benefit for the moment. That's how he works. He offers a benefit. Why, Eve, you will be like God. You will know things. What a benefit. But it's a scam. It's a scam. When we understand that our entire life, endeavoring to do the right thing, day by day, as a monk or zealot or Pharisee, or Essene, will not bring us life eternal. That'll be a good day when we realize that is useless, that kind of life. 
It is God who gifts us with life eternal, not ourselves. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Abraham visualized that city in the distance because he knew the promises. While he was living in the foreign land, he visualized that city. A refugee he was. He had no idea what was coming next. But he was obeying God in faith. That was his faith. He did what God said. What then do we have? Faith. That's what matters. And we have evidence of that faith when we look at ourselves. We hope we have that evidence. The works we do by faith will determine our reward. There are variable rewards, you know that. If you have forgotten, turn to 1 Corinthians. These verses are the basis of what I'm saying today. Speakers in the church of God must base their words on the written word of God. Everything else is dung. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. So he's building, it's the building, a building for God metaphor. And another builds on it. But let each one person Take heed how he builds on it. It means every one of us individually take heed. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, even straw. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. That's what fire does. It tests materials. Will they survive? If anyone's work which he has built endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, now get this, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so as through fire. So there can be severe testing and trials, but we will be saved. This is reassuring. Eternal life is a gift assured, even to those who are not very good at overcoming, you see? But there will be recompense. Now let's turn to Colossians 3, because I'm going to re refer to re recompense. Saul, I use the, the name Saul here. Saul was a very bad, hateful man. Look at what the same man Paul had to endure. 
while an apostle. Paul wrote to us in regard to this. Chapter 3, verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. That's a recompense. You will receive the reward. For you serve the Lord. But the next verse tells you. But he who, go, who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. Remember what Paul had to go through? He wasn't let off the hook. Yes, he trusted God. He believed God. But he had done things. He was not let off the hook. Paul knew what was going on with that. None of us are getting a free pass. That's my point. That's God's point. What troubles we have are appropriate. It could be worse. How? When we suffer without God, that could be worse. We must place ourselves before God in daily prayer. He listens. He plans our future. No matter what kind of baby we were, <clears throat> and in spite of all the nasty things that were done to us, and the nasty things we did to others along the way, after we were established a new creation at baptism. With fits and starts, God brought us to today. And the kingdom is not here yet. So there's more fits and starts to come. Depend on it. Today, we remain in a corrupt Babylon. Forces are all around us with powerful distractions, entertainments, and worldly benefits. That's how the adversary works. Satan hates us more than anything. He does. Each one of us will be tested. Is our personal time of testing over? Is our life going to be smooth sailing from now on to the resurrection? We do not know. Do we? Remember, the liberty God allowed Satan with Job? No, even after heart-wrenching losses, Job did not turn from God, proving his faith. All of God's people today are yearning for a more excellent world. He has promised us that. He loves it when we call him our God. Because he has prepared a place for us. You have received this information based upon the Word of God. Every additional topic concerning the truth, which originates in Scripture, builds understanding leading to salvation. We hope you will personally review the Scriptures cited in this presentation. God will teach you if you ask Him. Until next time, good day. Good day.